This is The Chris Abraham Show. All right, this is a little introduction to Season 5, Episode 36. I said a lot of words, so I'm just going to summarize it here. Uh, this cultural revolution is a trick. It's trying to trick us into a lowest common denominator culture as opposed to a highest common denominator culture because it is a lot cheaper to support a culture of ignorance than a culture of excellence, right? So... If nobody cares about history, literature, art, science, math, if all these things are racist and we want to be anti-racist, then we scrub everything from the uh, academic and excellence uh, concept of, what is it called, uh, uh, academic core or uh, liberal arts uh, curriculum or, you know, a, uh, a patriarchal, uh, Western imperialist, uh, uh, white-faced um, concept of history by the rulers and so forth. If we raise that down and get rid of all of our uh, historical studies, and if we do not pursue excellence in engineering, science, literature, art, history then that's super cheaper. We don't have to spend any money on that kind of stuff. And, and, and the entire country will not be judged based on how the populace is a bunch of undereducated um, uh, ignoramuses. It's going to be judged as uh, a beautiful equity, a beautiful equality, a beautiful respect of, uh, of, of emergent culture and uh, a respect for uh, the tribal nature of peoples in their own environment. And it won't be a constant comparison to a uh, white man's concept of oppressive colonial concept of an arbitrary concept of academic excellence. And it's a trick. It's a trick to not have to educate your kids, not have to have any expectations. Um, if if anti-racism and equity means we cut down all poppies, um, all there's going to be is like dirt. And if we normalize dirt, uh, and if uh, then that's on you and me. It's just gonna. I think maybe the right will be happy with that because dirt is cheaper. And if you just have a a dirt garden instead of a garden of beautiful flowers and tall poppies, then I guess people who want small government and don't want to spend money on the populace and only want to spend money on um, on foreign wars and foreign development, uh, they're not going to have to spend that money on you. So that's what this is about. Even though I talk story and I ramble and I go on and on and on, and don't forget that rich people will always spend money on excellence. Rich people will always spend money on on um, learning ancient Greek and Latin, and uh, will s- study uh, Western history, world history. Will learn um, Chinese. Will learn German and French. Will learn Spanish. Will be well traveled. Will study history and literature, and will travel the world and experience different cultures, and they will learn uh, trigonometry, and they will get fours in AP, and they will, they will have, they will go into, uh, they will get their masters, they will get their PhD, they will get their law degrees, they will get their doctorates, and uh, they will be like, ah, You don't have to be smart. Smart is racist. Smart is patriarchy. Just you be you while I'm over here with a brownstone on the Upper West Side. So don't fall for it. It's all tricks. 
It's to fool you into uh, lowest common denominator. It's to it's to fool you into not even uh, taking a grasp at the brass ring to say nothing of the golden ring or of the um, uh, uh, diamond ring or even, you know, the um, uh, platinum ring. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. Please give me feedback. The good news is that nobody listens to this, and I'll talk to you later. Love you. Bye-bye. Hey there. This is Chris Abraham, Season 5, Episode uh, 36. 30, 30, 36. Um, And I am here, and there's super background noises. There's the uh, ubiquitous sound of the uh, water feature at the water park. It's actually not a water park. It's just uh, kind of like one of those flagstone fountains where the water comes up from the ground into a giant cascade, and they encourage kids to play. And it's in my favorite Penrose Square Park, which is at the Cumber, uh, the corner of Columbia Pike and Barton. And I am here in the sun. And there is some extreme uh, construction going on in the street, but it's not in direct line. There's a building and a Starbucks between it, but you might hear that is background noise. I am sitting in the sun. I, uh, yesterday I was stupid enough to wear a 45 pound plate in my Rucker 3 or Rucker 4 and that was a mistake. That was very demotivating as you would say. Well, now there's lots of wind. I hope you guys don't hear the wind. You probably will. I will turn my back on the wind. Yes, that is smart. All right, now the wind's to my back, so hopefully it's going better. Um, And also, I'm putting my my giant torso in the way of all that noise, so hopefully that performs better. Although I do tend to run everything through normalize, and I run everything through uh, compress, and none of you have complained because nobody's listening. So what did I do over the weekend? I had a great Saturday. I had bought a pale pink tutu because Saturday was April 20, sorry, July 22nd, 2023. And on the 20, the 22nd of a month when it meets on a Saturday, all the members of Global Park Run uh, wear tutus during their run. But because I have time blindness and I don't know how strong I am yet, I didn't want to string along both uh, going to Park Run and also volunteering for the first time in years with the gang from my uh, Naval Lodge number four, volunteering with my brothers at the lodge for a community barbecue in support of the renewal and reintroduction of the Potomac Street Triangle Park, which is at the corner, I think, of 13 Southeast and Potomac Road, um, Potomac Avenue, I don't know, in uh, District of Columbia. So that was great. I could have done both. Like, it was not required that I got there at 11. And I just, you know, I wanted to be a good participant. I could have ridden, I could have ridden to uh, Park Run. I'll know this in the future. I could have ridden to Park Run on my bike. I could have participated by run walking, one jog walking, walking. I could have participated in the coffee hour afterwards. And then I could have taken um, is it Keybridge? I could have easily taken Keybridge into Georgetown and then just noodled across town till I got to uh, 13th Street Southeast and Potomac Road. And the brothers would have been there. They would have been glad to see me. Um, let me name them. It was, there was Chuck, 
who's from Haleiwa, and I think he went to Kahuku. Kahuku? Anyway, he's from Hawaii, so it was great to chat with him. And then there's David, and there's um, Rosario, who's the Worshipful Master of the Lodge, and uh, Larry, and uh, I forget the name of the other brother, damn it. It was a great time. I mean, nobody did anything until the end when they all, from the neighborhood, all swarmed down and we gave them as many hot dogs and hamburgers and cookies and and um, and uh, marshmallow bars and um, little bags of chips as they wanted. But it worked out at the end. The uh, Gorilla Gardeners were there, so it was co-sponsored by Naval Lodge Number no. Four and the Gorilla Gardeners. And I got a free extra large T-shirt that has that memorialized. So I went and I got the T-shirt. And what else? Um, so then my uh, bo- body battery on both my Garmin and my Fitbit was at zero. Or Fitbit was at one. And they're like, you got to relax today. So I still had to work. I did take a nap during the day because I... Worship at the hem of my battery, batter, battery, battery, my battery, body battery. And um, so I had the stupid idea since I hadn't packed up my slick modified scars, Coyote Ugly, Coyote Brown, Huckberry, Go Ruck 21, sorry, Go Ruck GR1. 26 liter bag with plates and stuff. So I've got this tropical multicam bag, my very first Go Ruck that I bought. That I bought, it was a Rucker, a 26 liter Rucker 4 in tropical multicam. And I uh, loaded that up with a 45. Nice. I loaded it up with a 45 pound plate that I had and never used because it's freaking heavy. And I suffered the rest of the day. It was terrible. It was, it was an ordeal when I packed it up with my laptop and my water and everything else. Like, honestly, I am too weak for that. So I took a picture and complained about that onto uh, Reddit onto the GoRuck Reddit, and everybody's like, yeah, you're an idiot. You went from 20 pounds to 45 pounds, idiot. Uh, and they gave me really good advice at uh, reddit.com slash r slash GoRuck. And today I'm running, I've packed up my Huckberry bag in Coyote Brown with a 20-pound. And you know what? You know what was good about doing that yesterday is um, I had been saying that the 20 pound bag was a little heavy and that it made me schlep less. But after dealing with the 45 pound uh, fricking uh, plate, the 20 pound feels really good and I'm pretty excited about the upcoming arrival of a 30 pound plate that I will then try instead. I will leave my 30 pound plate even after I get it, I will leave it until next Monday. So I will do one more week of 20 pound plate. Anyway, the, 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 um, the topic of today's podcast is as follows and sorry about the catching up. You know, you always have to do, um, the minutes and paperwork before you get into the topic of the, of the meeting. And today's topic is that what's happening in America's cultural revolution um, is, amongst other things, I don't want to get into any identity politics stuff, but I've sort of boiled it down into what happened in America when America was in search of excellence, where it uh, pursued works projects that had money for beauty, had money for art, had money for murals, 
had money for design um, into a world of 70s, 80s brutalism where everything was lowest, um, lowest, uh, como dit, uh, lowest bid. Our military was lowest bid. Our service providers are lowest bid. Our contractors are lowest bid. Our contracts are lowest bid. Everybody is lowest bid. And that is presumably to save money for the taxpayers, but it has had terrible ramifications in terms of the entire culture of America, which is uh, a natural culture of sustainability where things are built for 100 years and things are owned for 100 years and passed on to people in there uh, by grandparents and parents to a, um, uh, an economy of uh, disposability. Now, the topic of today, and I kind of talked to Jason, uh, my only listener who admits to listening. I talked to Jason about it. And uh, he's a community guy here, but I believe he's extremely leftist. But he's kind of a populist, and he's got a real open mind. And we talked about excellence. Like the works programs of the 20s and 30s. And how populism was key. And how, even though it was uh, uh, quasi... I mean, it wasn't called socialism, really. It was um, it was the New Deal, and it was the middle of a time when America was extremely anti-communist. So, whatever it was, it was an interesting time in American history when um, people produced amazing work products and projects, and it lasted into the '50s and then into the '60s a little bit. Where um, uh, political um, political houses and common houses and mayoral houses and um, capital buildings and churches and everything were developed in a designerly way. I mean, even to the 70s, um, architecture and design were key. Here in D.C., we started to abuse ourselves of brutalism. Um, and I personally love brutalism, and it seems like brutalism lasts for a hundred years anyway. But my belief is that all these behaviors of um, America also used to be a place where there was a goal that excellence was something that you needed to pursue: excellence in education, excellence in literature, excellence in grammar excellence in knowledge of history. They called it core requirements. They called it liberal arts. These were things that were built into a classical education. Latin, Greek, Spanish, French, German languages were built into K through 12. There was an exploration of, um, of the greats all the way back to, uh, to, to Socrates and Plato. Uh, there was a concept of aspiring to university. There was a desire to aspire to at the academy, to, um, to a professional life, to a successful life. And even if you were going into the military or becoming a worker, there was an idea that um, being a good man, a civilian or military or academic role model, to being the best dad you can be, to being, uh, to supporting uh, traditional roles and traditional uh, beliefs and, and trying to work on a homogeneous, homogeneous uh, cultural system where we all aspired to virtue and moral into a moral compass, whatever that is, uh, those were things that were normalized in America, and that was things that people were aspiring to. However, that leaves a lot of people out, and not everybody is bought into wanting to 
improve their lot every year, right? And not unlike a culture that goes from pursuing excellence to enabling a lowest uh, lowest bid culture where good enough is good enough as long as it meets specs, as long as it meets minimal specs. I believe that the culture revolution is not so much pro-LGBTQ or pro-people of color or pro-equity or pro-Asian um, um, and Pacific Islanders or pro uh, even pro-socialism or pro-democracy, or any of those things. I believe that the thing that all of these have in common is that there is a new pride in settling for the lowest common denominator, and that uh, this is a an intentional attack on the idea of, of uh, excellence, and is the next chapter in American culture, which I saw all the time in Hawaii, and which they even have a name for in Australia and in New Zealand. I don't know if they talk about it in England, but in, in Hawaii, in Hawaii, in uh, China, I know, um, maybe in Japan, maybe not. Uh, I know that this is something that people deal with all the time in Australia and in New Zealand, and they complain about it. Um, in Hawaii, we used to call it the protruding nail theory, which is if you are um, any different from everybody else, whether it's, uh, and it's usually conceived as prideful or excellent, or if you're extremely successful or extremely powerful, or if you are showing everybody else up, or if you're making everybody feel embarrassed, or if you're making them look bad, it is important to hammer down that nail so that everybody is flush with the culture. Now, for whatever reason, I don't know if, I don't know if like Australia or New Zealand, you guys tell me, are Australia or New Zealand up uh, high poppy producers, or is this a theory adopted by Chinese poppy production, because they call it uh, the tall poppy um, theory, which is anybody in their culture who is, like, too fancy or too arrogant, like, I feel like we had sort of this in, in America, where, um, there was, you know, a waspy culture uh, that actually existed the longest in D.C., where even if you have an Austin Healey or a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a Maserati, you don't drive that during your five days at work. You drive your Ford Taurus. And it was always the Ford Taurus, like this idea that you have a Ferrari or a Lamborghini in your garage for playtime, but when you come to work, you, you drive in your Sable or your Ford Taurus. Um, you drive in your whatever, your Camry, uh, you drive in your, and not your Lexus. And now, and this used to be the thing happening in, in uh, when I lived in England too, um, the rich scion of British wealth might have owned an Audi 5000 or whatever in the 80s, but when they came to university, if they brought their car, they bought a Citroën de cheveux, chevaux, cheveux, de cheveux, a 2CV, cheveux, cheveux, cheveux. Anyway, uh, instead of their, their, their flash Audi, right? Um, if you live in Kent and everybody in Kent is rich, you can drive your Audi. But when you're in a place, when you're in a public university, uh, you need to tone it down. Uh, it was so funny. The same people who brought their deux cheveux, um, or deux cheveux, or deux cheveux, um, they would, instead of sounding uh, Queen's English with their Ponzi pipes, they, it was the funniest thing. They would come to 
uh, school in their Jushivu, and they would say, Oi, mate, core blimey governor. Oi, oi, oi. Huzzah. And then they would, you get them drunk, and they'd be like, Oh, yeah, huzzah, huzzah, rather. As opposed to um, uh, working class people who pretend to be rich, and then you get them drunk, and then their fancy accents all of a sudden become govna, govna, govna. Koblami gov. And that was the state of the world. For whatever reason, in the, uh, in the last 20 years, it's become extremely popular to drive your Lambo around. That might have been the result of, um, of uh, oligarchs moving into London and possibly Saudi money and uh, new, you know, but there became, um, oh, so what happened when I was in uni in 1990 in England, 91, there was uh, a culture of using pence coins and pennying people's fancy cars. It was really anti, anti-rich. anti And the anti-rich culture is not existing anymore. And only now the eco-terrorists are starting to take indelible ink and, and uh, spray washing down uh, mega yachts and stuff like that. And I don't encourage that behavior, but why aren't you guys doing it? Anyway, and I don't encourage that behavior, but what the fuck aren't you, why aren't you fucking doing that shit, pussies? Um, so, I believe that there, I mean, you know how much I love uh, Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut and the idea that a despotic uh, dystopian future, everybody with excellence will be uh, handicapped in a way that makes um, people with 100 IQs and normal athletic prowess who are five foot ten. And 40 regular with 100 IQs to make them feel not intimidated and not bad about their bodies. Uh, people with beautiful bodies have to wear baggy clothing. Uh, people with uh, lots of natural physical strength will have to be encumbered by weights and chains. People with beautiful voices will have to wear ball gags. People with beautiful eyes will have to wear glasses. People with beautiful hair will have to wear hair coverings or have their heads shaved. People with pretty hands will have to wear gloves. People who have a lots of brains have to wear earpieces in their ears that randomly will create shocking, loud, dissonant, diso dissodent sounds in their ears to break their train of thoughts. And as someone with uh, with with aphantasia, I want something to stop people from visualizing so much. Whether that's um, uh, putting LED, random uh, bright LEDs in their eyeballs or whatever. So, that's what I think is happening. I think that um, when you can speak whatever regional dialect you want, when nobody even cares about hiring teachers that have a Perception, a per, per, uh, perception of perfect writing, exceptionally writing, beautiful storytelling, um, 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 based like Western history, uh, even beautiful literature written by all kinds of people of colors and high diversity. I mean, there are beautiful literary works coming out from all over the world. That, uh, that I encourage one to read. Um, Ishiguru, you know, Solomon Rushdie, um, Murakami. I mean, but these, all these people have an excellence in literature, an excellence in writing, an excellence in thought. There's philosophers, there's theologians, there's... Um, uh, all these other things and what it is 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 there's an entire campaign of whoever you are right now is just dandy in fact um, you shouldn't feel bad about your merit-based world 
your struggles in the world are good enough to get you into an excellent place of learning or whatnot. I mean, I don't, I do believe that people of poverty, people of suffering, people who've suffered lacks of dignities, people who are oppressed through racism, sexism, or uh, sexualism, or through gender identity, all these things, should be kid-gloved. But they should be kid-gloved from, uh, I mean, every child should have free pre-K. Every child should be taught in excellence from pre-K all the way through 12th grade so that when people apply for university, it is an even playing field. If you let a uh, inner city kid get into Princeton and he washes out in a, in a semester because he wasn't prepared for the fact that those children... I'd say 80% of the 50% even, 80% of those children have been highly tutored, highly educated, extremely well-funded, extremely well-tutored, going to the best day schools, going to the best um, uh, boarding schools, having enriching experiences during every break, having traveled the world, having mastered languages, having volunteered, and on holidays, instead of getting stuck going home, uh, are on off to their trick to their trips. And if they don't invite you along and underwrite your experience, then you're going home back to 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 poverty. Maybe you can get a summer internship. Maybe you can find a way of spreading that gap. But there are so many stories that people who are in lower lower to lower middle class, including me, I had the most incredible culture shock when I went to GW. I had never seen kids who had so much comfort and confidence, but also so much spendable money. They all had, you know, I mean, up until recently, um, traditional observant Jewish families would never buy German or Japan. Well, would never buy German cars. So Every um, of my Jewish classmates who came for money, uh, they only had Volvos or Saabs. I don't know how it is now, but there were lots of Volvos, lots of Saabs. There were lots of awesome holidays. There were lots of, you know, awesome trips. A lot of their parents would fly down in their, their planes. A lot of, some of the kids even had their pilot's license, which wasn't, intimidating to me because I was a dive master and all these other things. I grew up in Hawaii. I had comp I had competitive strut because I grew up in Hawaii and I was a dive instructor and all and I was, you know, tall and handsome and I, my parents extremely valued education and history and literature and art. So I but even I I never wash out because I'm an only child and there's nothing anybody can do to frustrate me. Um, I'm not a pack animal, so um, I can always withdraw into my little hovel house and just do my own thing. So that doesn't work very well, but I feel like it's really important to understand that if you're going to bring someone who has no cultural instinct no cultural experience and actually can be very quickly and culturally drummed out of the university of, a, of an Ivy League school just based on being laughed at for the way you talk, being laughed at for the questions you ask, being laughed at for, or even worse, let's say that you are Let's say everybody on campus knows that you are a protected species and that everybody walks on eggshells every time you see, they see you walking around and everybody's really nice to you. You know when those people are being like condescending, you know when people are kind of rolling their eyes at you or laughing behind your back. You know that when you don't fit in, 
or you're just being included because you're kind of like that annoying little sister that your mom tells you that you have to bring along with you. Um, you know when you don't belong. And you know, like I saw this with... Um, I did a pretty good job, I think, of belonging when I was studying abroad in England. They did spend a lot of time trying to integrate us into, um, you know, first or second year out of three year university students. I feel like they um, integrated me into a hall that had a little bit older students and not just 17 and 18 year olds. Uh, because, you know, by junior year, I'm like, you know, 20, 21. Um, but I noticed that all the all the Chinese students from China, and there were at least a hundred or so on campus, I know that they didn't mix at all. Like, they had their entire area. They had, you know, they were in the ziggurat at UEA, but, like, they were completely hanging out with themselves. Like, I could definitely see, let's say, a thousand or, or 500 people of color or let's say, a 1,000 or 500 lower-income uh, boys and girls were brought to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Dartmouth, etc. Like, at first, there would be an extreme noblesse oblige desire to have your first black friend, have your first gay friend, whatever, have your first trans friend. But, like, once you get through the uniqueness of that... I wonder if people, like, return to their own, like, natural, upper-class, rich, from Choate, you know, from Exeter, like, little cliques of people who have their own condos, parents bought them an investment property, have their own car, have their own plans, have money to spend at the local bar or pub, you know, people who are easy to roll with as opposed to um, spending your entire college career doing the equivalent of volunteering in Costa Rica and helping the people there, right? Like at some point, if you don't have a real heart of gold and if you don't want to become your brother's keeper, I dare say that at some point people are going to find it laborious and lose the instinct of wanting to Unless it becomes a role, like if you become, like I did a lot of, um, <clears throat> I wasn't from a rich family and didn't have lots of money and wasn't, I ended up having to get work study, lots and lots of work study. And like some of that work study is being like a resident, uh, an RA, right? Others are like being a desk attendant at, uh, being like a concierge at, at my, at the, uh, various and sundry um, dorms and like there's a lot of like you know things you can do you can work at the cafe the cafeteria you know like there's a lot of work study things that they they allow you to do right so let's say the minority students are doing lots of work study is that kind of like a indentured servitude is that kind of like uh, you know the poor black and brown people are all working at the cafeteria. Like, is that kind of like a little bit of, you know, it has bad, extremely bad um, uh, optics, right? Like, uh, all the black and brown people are working at the cafeterias and doing, you know, menial work, study work at the university. That seems kind of classist. That seems kind of bad, right? Shouldn't everybody do work-study programs at the university or should nobody do it? What about all that money in the endowment? Can't you go ahead and underwrite every single person in the university so that they don't have to do menial work? Because if you do menial work for uh, work-study, doesn't that show everybody that you're a poor? And isn't that not equity showing people demonstrably that you are a poor on campus isn't that shameful and humiliating and shouldn't the uh, uh, the poor people in a well the poor um, people on a college campus shouldn't they be paid a per diem 
shouldn't they be underwritten both in um, both for like for everything they should be underwritten uh, to have spending money to have living money to have uh, tuition money uh, to have um, places to stay during the summer months to have free food free lodging um, extra money for clothes a clothing budget there should be everything if the equity was real there should be everything to bring everybody on that campus up to at least an upper middle class if not an upper class quality of life they should be uh, not brought down to a lowest common denominator they should be brought up to a highest common denominator they should have all the funding that the scion of the oligarchs have or the sign of the oligarchs should be um, I know that in a lot of universities when I went uh, freshman year you were not allowed to bring a car to campus you had to be you know one thing I loved about st. Louis and that I didn't want to go to Punahou really is that first of all I didn't want to embarrass my parents by how much money they did or didn't have little did I know that we had a rich pop I had a rich pop-up anyway I didn't want to embarrass my parents about money uh, and I was glad to find out that all you need to do is like buy four or five um, um, st. Louis brand Aloha shirts and like four or five um, um, st. Louis approved uh, dress pants and like a couple pairs of st. Louis approved uh, dress shoes and you were good for the entire year right so when I see things like boarding schools or day schools in Great Britain where everybody has to wear a blazer with an emblazed crest and a button down and um, whatever some sort of tie and khakis and 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 like I feel like that's sort of an equity thing and I think uniforms are uh, an enforced equity because people can't signify based on the quality and expense and brand of the things they wear or the things that they do or don't own um, because classism is going to be the new racism on campus because racism sexism gender is um uh sexuality ism sexual orientation ism is just not okay anymore so um and not even making fun of people because they're fat and i'm fat so i can say that um so the only thing you can do now i guess on campus is call people poor or stupid poor or stupid i guess poor or stupid and so you need to take care of the poor to make equity real and you need to take care of the stupid now if we if we enter into a culture where we all need to act as colloquial as humanly possible maybe that'll take care of things maybe so my mom told me that in the household I needed to speak proper English what that also meant is that my mom said in the household we will only watch PBS in the household we will only read books uh, about relativity and Carl Sagan the books in our house will be books um, about Monet, about Renoir, about um, um, ancient Egypt. We had books about geography. We had books about geology. Um, we talked about literature. My mom shared her favorite book, which was Treasure Island. We always spent money on books. We had um, coffee table books. We had beautiful books. Um, my mom even let me read all the stuff from the Executioner series, Mac Bolan, Able Team, Phoenix Force. I became obsessed with this Harlequin style boy adventure novels and my mom never complained because she said you were reading every day. We were subscribed to boxes of books and you would blow through those books. And if you were a reader, I knew that you would read for the rest of your life. Um, 
my mom got me a used uh, VW putty-colored four-door rabbit when I was 16. My parents stretched for that, but primarily my mom and dad didn't want to be um, didn't want to be my chauffeurs, but they never were. Like I was taking city buses and stuff, but my mom and dad stretched so that I would have a decent car. Um, so when I got to GW, I had a license, I had uh, cultural hunger, I had learning hunger, I had a desire for... Uh, I ran out of classes at, at St. Louis because I would always go to summer school. Uh, so they allowed me to take philosophy classes at Chaminade. I took philosophy classes like I loved. I, when I got to university, I knew about, um, you know, um, I knew about uh, the Greeks. I knew about Descartes. I knew about Kant. I knew about um, uh, um, uh, Hegel. I mean... I pretty much was groomed to be a snobby little highfalutin pissant. I, wa I started uh, St. Louis's speech and debate team. I always held uh, grammar and rhetoric to a high standard. I took um, uh, Jason McLennan and I were a team uh, in the debate team, and we walked around literally with legal. Like, you know, they were vinyl, but, you know, uh, legal kind of boxy file attaches. We would spend enormous times researching together for our studies. My mom told me that oh, when you're in the house, you are a uh, um, uh, Manhattanite. When you are outside, you know, speak pigeon, hang out with your friends, talk local kind be totally cool like that, go to dances, talk like one local boy, be one kama aina. But when you at home, Chris, you're going to be one freaking howly, right? But I know like people talking to you, brah, and saying that you on freaking howly in a culture that going to say that brown brothers are like, you know, freaking uh, Oreos, you know, black on the outside, white on the uh, inside. And that the, like, you know, local kind, Japanese, Chinese, Asian boys and girls, if they stay smart and if they in national honor society, then they're going to be like bananas and Twinkies, you know? Like totally yellow on the outside, mm -hmm. brah, and, you know, white on the inside, and that's not cool. And my mom was afraid of that. And when I was in... Intermediate school, I really tried to become like, you know, the lock in, like the, um, uh, um, like, B, like a B-boy. Like I wanted to, I drew cartoons of people popping and locking and I would like listen to Lisa Lisa in this cult jam and, and I was totally into like, you know, um, the proto rap and and I went to school dances. This is before like seventh and eighth grade sixth and seventh and eighth grade is before I discovered British music and before my friends, you know, started to listen to New Order and Duran Duran and Culture Club and Wham and before like I'm pretty sure my mom started to think I was gay. Um Man, I should have known that my mom totally thought I was gay. Like, she was, she was like, subscribing me to Sports Illustrated and, like, all this stuff. Like, I think that's awesome. I think that the, that my mom was afraid I was gay is freaking awesome. I would rather that than my New York City mom thinking I was, like, some sort of freaking... Like, little did she know I had a, a bat covered in colorful electric tape in the back of my uh, VW Rabbit, and that had, uh, using sharp, thick Sharpie, it had moke remover written on it. And I carried around a baseball bat with colorful tape on it, and kind of a, it was kind of like a lot of red, white, and black. So it looked a lot of, of, of like, um, like abstract expressionism. Um, but it had moke remover written on it. I used to carry it around in my back seat 
just in case I was uh, gang bum bum rushed by a bunch of mokes. Um, so that's who I really was. My mom also didn't know that at seventh grade, I, my mom knew in elementary school that local kids would like gang up on me and try to beat me up. And she was always impressed that I would stand them down. But I don't think she knew that seventh grade, when I hit St. Louis, a kid like called me out. He was ninth grade and wanted to fight me by the arts um, annex. And so after school, uh, I don't know if they do this in your neighborhood, but the bullies take off their, their nice shirts to fight bare chested. And nobody sat me down and taught me the rules of like street boxing. I thought they were kill or be killed. So my strategy whenever I got in a fight in Hawaii was um, uh, preemptive. So I knew that if someone was going to be like boxing shuffle and then going to take off their shirt, I knew from, from observance and from experience that they were going to fight next. So uh, the moment the guy started taking off his shirt, I freaking bum rushed him, sucker punched him, knocked him down and kicked the shit out of him. And for the remaining six years, uh, people kind of avoided me. Like, they were like, oh, Chris, he's freaking cool, yeah, but fucking crazy, that guy. Um, so maybe I destroyed my ability to be invited to um, uh, birthday parties and stuff for fear that I was freaking crazy. But um, I think my best friends know that I'm still like that. So I apologize in advance. Um, I'm a, I'm a sweetheart. Like, I'm like every... What is that, the whole thing they have on, on Twitter, on TikTok? Like, um, uh, big guys are always very sweet because they um, don't really have to fight that much. But they're also 300-pound, strong, big, like, apex predator men. So uh, don't assume that just because a big guy is sweet and charming and loving and tender and affectionate and and peaceful, and God-loving, and honest, and loyal, and sweet, don't, um, don't also assume concurrently that he can't, uh, punch your teeth down your throat. So, anyway, I dare say that this concept of lowest common denominator, uh, hammering down the hammering down the protruding nails and cutting the protruding poppies, the tall poppies, is the strategy that's happening because it's cheaper. It's lowest bid, right? Lowest common denominator culture is a culture that tries to make people feel less poor because ignorance is normalized. It's really freaking expensive to bring poor undereducated, uneducated, quote-unquote ignorant, poor people, including myself, and bringing them in to rarefied air of a top four university and spend that freaking endowment money on turning all of those kids while they're in university into children who live their daily lives as rich as though they have oligarchs and Trumps, and Obamas, and Bidens, and um, Musks, and Gateses, as and and um, what Amazon guy, uh, um, Bezos, as their parents. Once you get excited into a university like Brown or or Harvard or even GW, the endowment pocketbook should be opened to build the equity up to a highest denominator and underwrite everybody's experience for the next four years or six years or eight years all the way through to a postdoc as if they were living out of the pocket of their rich multi-generational parents. All right. So amen to that. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys soon. Love you and bye-bye.
thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.